My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. This morning, I did a trump on Minnie. You're fired. The reason is, she disagreed with me. She told me that I should take off my glasses and smile more often. And I explained to her that th this would have three consequences. The female half of the audience will probably puke. The male half of the audience will reach for their guns and YouTube will ban or delete my channel for obscene online material. And then she dared to say, I disagree with you. Serious mistake. Fired. No, I'm just kidding. Minnie is one woman I would never devalue and discard. And here she is. Today, uh, earlier today, I uploaded a video to my YouTube channel, a video that was intended to demonstrate to you the power of cognitive dissonance. The video is a 1974 rendition of my bar mitzvah. There was a videographer there, and he recorded the entire, entire Jewish ritual. The bar mitzvah takes place when a Jewish boy is 13 years old, and transitions from childhood to adulthood. This is a rite of passage, in a way. And the whole thing has been recorded. I gave a half an hour speech, and there were hundreds of people in the audience, and so on and so forth, and I uploaded the video. Now, this created in many of you cognitive dissonance, because you are supposed to hate narcissists. You are supposed to despise them. You are supposed to consider every aspect of their personality and conduct and even appearance to be repulsive, off-putting, hateful. And here I am on this Bar Mitzvah video. Pretty cute, even if I say so. Very self-assured, very, well, relatively well-dressed, addressing a public very confidently, and so on and so forth. There are almost no negative aspects in this video. You couldn't, most of you could not reconcile these two elements, the hatred and contempt you feel towards narcissists, and the fact that here was a narcissist, a humanized narcissist, a narcissist, I, I gave you access to my childhood. I showed you that I haven't been such a monster when I was 13 years old, and you couldn't put the two things together. And this created an avalanche of hate speech. I received hundreds of hateful, deriding, contemptuous, violent, aggressive comments. There were very few positive comments. The vast majority of people found it very unsettling, this contradiction. And this is a perfect example of intermittent reinforcement. The narcissist is never constant, never stable. One minute is a monster, and the next minute, he's a kind, gregarious, generous, even altruistic person, charitable in a way. He's a giver. One minute, he is a buffoon, full, full of himself, full, pompous, grandiose, verbose. And the next minute is actually sagacious and perspicacious. Look these words up in the dictionary. So, it's very difficult to reconcile the narcissists. To, it's very difficult to establish a single position with regards to the narcissist, because the narcissist, narcissism is a case, as I've been saying for well over 25 years, narcissism is a case, in my view, a private case of multiple personality disorder. It's a private case of dissociative identity disorder being a post-traumatic condition. And my Bar Mitzvah video only proves this. When you're confronted with conflicting aspects and dimensions of the narcissist's personality, traits, behaviors, you can't put them together. And this creates in you an inner conflict known as a dissonance. In this case, cognitive dissonance. And there's nothing more anxiety-producing, anxiety-inducing than a dissonance. So being with a narcissist is a constant state of anxiety. And a lot of this anxiety doesn't emanate from the narcissist, actually. 
It emanates from your inner dialogue. Your inner dialogue. He's a monster, but he's cute. He's an ugly person, but actually sometimes he's handsome. Look at him. He's devilish. Look at him. He's a cutie pie. How do you put these two things together? You don't, because both of them exist in the narcissist. This is not, not today's topic, as Minnie keeps reminding me. Today's topic is the way the narcissist goes through, through three phases, three phases in his relationships. You remember yesterday we discussed the three roles that the narcissist assigns to women in his life. Um, admirer, fan, and then playmate, and then mother. Now these three roles correspond to three phases in the evolution of every relationship with the narcissist. By the way, not only with women, but today we'll, today we'll confine ourselves to romantic relationships, or intimate relationships, but actually this applies to business, workplace, any other environment where narcissists reach a modicum of intimacy with people. Still, again, today we're going to discuss women. And the narcissist in his relationships goes through three phases, the shared fantasy, the interstitial phase, and anti-fantasy. But before we go there, we need to ask ourselves, why do narcissists make promises they cannot keep? Why do they lie about the depth and intensity of their alleged ostensible emotions? Why do they mislead women? Why do, do they deceive them into believing that they are open to long-term relationships and so on and so forth? Well, first of all, because many narcissists cannot obtain sex. They, they are not the material for casual sex. They are old, they are unattractive, and frankly, they are narcissistic. Even the most good-looking narcissist at some, at some phase, the mask falls and you see that it's a jerk. It's uh, an obnoxious person, not very conducive to sex. There's a problem with casual sex. But there is an even deeper problem. Contra, contrary to misinformation online, and most of the so-called information online is misinformation, there is um, um, heterosexual psychopathic narcissists usually shun casual sex and one-night stands because they feel objectified by the women counterparts. And they abhor the equipotence. They abhor the fact that in casual sex, there's a power, power symmetry. Both men and women have equal power. They hate to be in a situation where they have equal power. Psychopathic narcissists are mildly sadistic. They need to dominate the female, reduce her to unthinking submission. And this can be brought on by only by unrequited or tantalizing craving. And then once they have reduced her to this state of submission, they make the woman act in ways that she would find normally shameful, hurtful, denigrating, guilt-inducing. They make her trash herself. It's faintly sadistic, and sometimes not so faintly. So to reach this state, I mean, it's very rare to reach this state in, in casual sex. Um, none of these can be accomplished in brief anonymous encounters. Grooming takes time, effort, careful planning and preparations and, and repeated exposure to the, to the psychopathic narcissist. On the other hand, psychopathic narcissists and narcissists and psychopaths, they, they are not, they're not made for love affairs. They, are, they, they lack basic courting skills and intersex or intergender protocols. They are bored by other people. Um, they are not really into companionship. They, they are very childlike in this sense. What they want to have is what I call the three S's. They want to have supply, narcissistic supply. They want to have sex, and it's usually childlike sex. It's uh, childish. It's kind of a fucking fun, if you wish. And they want to have services. They want to be served. So they can't have casual sex, or casual sex doesn't fit them that well, because they're not sadist in sadistic domination in casual sex. They can't really have love affair, because they have no access to their emotions, they're not really interested in the other party, 
They have no empathy. They don't grasp intimacy um, in all its intricacies. They are afraid, actually. They feel threatened by intimacy and so on and so on. Love is out of the window. Casual sex is out of, of the, the other window of the door. What's left? What's left is pretension. So, narcissists and psychopaths pretend that they are interested in long-term committed adult relationships. And they do this in order to get women to date, date them and have sex with them. And this deception, this deception is what I call the shared fantasy. At some point, it backfires in a second stage, which I call the interstitial phase. We're going to discuss all these phases in great detail. That's a long video, one of the videos you love to hate. So there's a deception, shared fantasy, then it backfires in the interstitial phase, where women try to, so to speak, cash the check. And then it leads to acrimonious breakups, brought on usually by cheating and triangulation and heartbreak all around. And that's in the anti-fantasy stage, the third stage. Um, of course, narcissists and, and psychopaths are not interested in women. They're not interested in people. They're not able to grasp the distinctiveness, the separateness, the individuality, the autonomy, the agency of other people. They regard other people as 2D, 2D contraptions. It's kind of um, animated functions. They internalize people, as I said yesterday, and they interact with the, interna with the internal object. They interact with the snapshot. They, for them, narcissists and psychopaths live, live in a world where a world of shadows, where when people move around them, when when people when when someone touches them and so on, it's like a shadow would. And very often you would see a recoil, a physical recoil. When you touch a narcissist or psychopath, they, they recoil. It's like a startle reaction, and it is technically a startle reaction, a part of post -tra post traumatic condition. So narcissists and psychopaths use sex and they use love bombing to groom and secure a woman, to provide them with any two of the three aforementioned S's. Remember? Supply, sex, services. And they do all this within the stage called share fantasy, which, which I will describe shortly. But even as they are inside the deception, even as they share the fantasy with a female candidate, so to speak, they anticipate the next phases. They anticipate the interstitial phase, and the anti-fantasy. They know that it's going to culminate in cheating, triangulation, abandonment, loss. So they keep the relationship provisional and at a later stage sexless and definitely emotionally uninvolved. So sometimes they are able to reach an accommodation with their so-called intimate partner. So they have open relationships or in marriages, where they receive one of the S's from the intimate partner and another S from another woman and so on and so forth. So these become like harems, harems of women, each one providing one of the S's. And in such arrangements, open marriages and open relationships, of course, the intimate partner, the narcissist and psychopath's intimate partner, is also allowed to, to outsource her needs to, to be with other men, to cheat consensually. And there's no hurt involved. There's no, there are no emotional repercussions to this kind of arrangement. But this is a minority of the cases. According to latest statistics, about 3% of the cases. In 97% of the cases, both parties, psychopathic narcissist and his intimate partner, go through all three phases inexorably, repeatedly, again and again, like some kind of perpetuum mobile, deranged perpetuum mobile. Let's start with the shared fantasy phase. The shared fantasy phase, also known as love bombing, a phase of, phase of infatuation, lust. It's a honeymoon phase. And the sexuality in this phase is um, either remote, virtual, so a lot of sexting and so on, or it is sadistic, sadistic humiliation and, and kinky, uh, which is the typical sexuality of psychopaths and narcissists. So they, they co-opt. They don't coerce, but they, they co-opt. They get the woman to collaborate. 
with this kind of sexuality. And usually in the shared fantasy phase, there is sexual exclusivity. Now, the narcissist and psychopaths, psychopath in this phase, he suspends judgment. He realizes that he has to play into the delusions of the intimate partner. And he can't do that if there is constant analysis and control of the information. So he intentionally suspends judgment and he renders himself, the psychopathic narcissist, renders himself gullible and delusional. But only when it comes to emotions, intimacy, um, the capacity and intent to, be, to hurt him, and the nature in, of, and intensity of the relationship. When it comes to these issues, the psychopathic narcissist says, I'm going to turn off my hypervigilance. I'm not going to scan for threats and I'm going to let go. I'm going to, to flow into the territory of my intimate partner. There's no other way to do it. Because with a psychopathic narcissist, there is a process of merger and fusion, very similar to the merger or fusion with borderlines or with codependence. A psychopathic narcissist idealizes the partner and at the same time uses Primitive defense mechanisms like splitting, denial, confirmation bias. Uh, he assumes the role of a rescuer or a wizard, um, a messianic role. And some of them, if the cerebral ones, they wear the Wunderkind mask, the mask of a child genius. And they are grandiose. So all this, all this is in play. The narcissist presents to his potential intimate partner a kind of a narrative, a story where he is a genius, a wizard, he can rescue her, he can solve all her problems, he can, he can heal her wounds, he can solve her pain, he, he is the answer to everything she, she had ever hoped for, wanted or dreamt of. Um, even so, the psychopathic narcissist is very careful to separate the shared fantasy from the rest of his life. It's like when he is scouting for and grooming an intimate partner, it's um, a safe and unreal realm, an unreal kingdom. It's role play. It's a little like video, a video game. It's it's not entirely. I mean, when you're in a video, when you when you're, you're playing a video game, or when you're role playing, or even when you're inside a fantasy, of course you're there. There's a process of dissociation. You detach from the world and you enter the. Even when you watch when you're watching a movie, I mean, watching a movie is a process of dissociation. Cut off 99% of the world when you're in the movie. So it's the same feeling in the shared fantasy phase. It's like the psychopath goes to work and the narcissist comes back from work and everything and then he switches off reality and he enters he enters the 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 online game he enters this fantastic disney-like castle kingdom and um it's like a multiplayer game where he's one of the players the intimate partner is another and they both pretend to be, to inhabit uh, together some kind of kingdom, some kind of territory, some kind of country, which they both know um, doesn't exist. The only difference is that at some stage, the emotional neediness of the intimate partner, many of these intimate partners are borderline, codependent, or otherwise wounded, broken and damaged women who were subjected to very extended abuse and they're in the throes of uh, CPTSD, complex PTSD. And so these, these women are amenable to blur the boundaries, to blur the borders, to, to blur the distinctions between reality and fantasy. Gradually, the psychopathic narcissist somehow convinces his potential intimate partner that the, the shared fantasy is shared, but not a fantasy. That it's, it's, that it's, the difference between the fantasy and reality is, is this small. It's just up to her. If she just takes the extra step, the fantasy could become reality. It's very tempting. It's irresistible, actually. These intimate partners, they, uh, they gradually acquire the conviction. They're, they gradually become convinced that, um, you know, they don't have to do much. 
to suddenly live in the magical kingdom uh, in which all problems are solved, all pains are assuaged, all damages are fixed, and one's brokenness is put together. Uh, it's like Humpty Dumpty, you know, put, put it back together. And it's as real. And so, but you can ask, how does the psychopathic narcissist allow himself to be so vulnerable? How does he allow himself to, to be gullible, to, to open himself up to potential hurt, potential abuse, exploitation, and so on? Well, it's because he doesn't feel threatened. He doesn't feel threatened because it's like virtual reality. There are no repercussions or outcomes in the real world. It's a game. It's an online multiplayer game. The shared fantasy allows the psychopathic narcissist to avoid true intimacy, true commitment. It's his way of shirking, of avoiding, of shunning adult responsibilities and chores. He gets, in the shared fantasy, he gets companionship. If there's a physical compliment, then he gets, he gets to have sex and have fun and adventures. And on the other hand, he invests only the minimum necessary to maintain the fantasy going. There is no real risk in the shared fantasy phase. No real risk because it never spills over into reality. And in this particular phase, the psychopathic narcissist usually presents a fallacious, fallacious facade. He gives the wrong information. He prevaricates. He lies. He confabulates. He doesn't give the potential intimate partner, partner any hold on him, any way to, to for example, blackmail him or to somehow impact his life. It's like he creates an avatar. He creates an, um, a virtual figure, a virtual character in an animated video game with, with which or with whom the intimate partner interacts. And behind, he's hiding behind this virtual character. And if he's married, he's also using his marriage as a protective shield and as an excuse not to get too committed, too involved, too present, or too forthcoming with information. This, he also constantly maintains the tension because there's a disappearing act. He appears, he disappears. It's not silent treatment. It's not an aggressive uh, form of, commun of, of, uh, of communicating displeasure. It's simply... Here I am, here I'm not. It's like he's ephemeral. He's an apparition. He's a ghost. And no wonder we're using the term ghosting. The fantasy phase feels like a role-playing game. I said that. Or like a movie set. And the psychopathic narcissist is an actor following an unpredictable, thrilling, unfolding script. Remember that psychopathic narcissists uh, are novelty-seeking. They are risk-takers. They're reckless. They, they are very impulsive. And in this sense, they are like children in a sandbox. So here's this child in a sandbox. And he wants another child to join him. Share the sandbox. Play a little. Let's pretend that the sandbox is, I don't know, a tank. Or a kingdom. Or a castle. That's the shared psychosis. It feels safe. The shared fantasy, I'm sorry. It feels safe because it's not real. The, the shared fantasy usually includes elements of intermittent sex, fun, companionship, supply, adventure, money, and money-making. Um, on the psychopathic narcissist side, on the potential partner side, usually the shared fantasy includes elements like marriage or children or home, uh, or, or becoming a couple, or even love. So to start with, the seeds of its own destruction and annihilation exist in the shared fantasy because shared fantasy is incompatible. The two fantasies are incompatible. The psychopathic narcissist would lie to the intimate partner. She wants love, he will tell her he loves her. She wants to become a couple, he says, of course we are a couple. Marriage, yeah, sure, I'm divorcing my wife, children, at some point, a home, you know. So he would, he would go along, he would go along with the intimate partner's fantasy, he would even, even leverage this fantasy. He would sometimes enhance or amplify some of its aspects, sending titillating hints and messages, and, um, kind of clues. Um, but he, he doesn't really believe in that. It's not his fantasy. His fantasy 
It's fun. Sex, supply, adventure, money. It's a, it's a puerile fantasy. The narcissistic psychopath is what used to be called puer eternus, um, permanent or eternal uh, adolescent. And uh, much later, there was a, a wonderful book by Dan, uh, psychotherapist Dan uh, Kiley, and he, he wrote the book The Peter Pan Syndrome. The Peter Pan Syndrome. Peter Pan was a, was a, a fictitious character written, written by a chap called Barry in the 19th century. Peter Pan refused to grow up. Peter Pan has this in, in the 20th century, I'm sorry. Peter Pan has this, these constant dialogues with women. He has dialogues with Tinkerbell, Bell, which is not a real woman, it's a virtual woman, it's a fairy. He has dialogues with real women, like Wendy, her mother. Um, he has dialogues even with, uh, with promiscuous women. Women who are out to get him sexually. <laughs> they want him, they desire him sexually. And, and the book is amazing because it's a perfect depiction of the inner world of the psychopathic narcissist. The dialogues are very much, very adult, very mature. For a children's book, it's shocking how adult, mature, overt, I would even say sometimes pornographic, the material is. And Peter Pan says clearly multiple and numerous times, I don't want to grow up. I don't want to grow up. I don't want to become an adult. I don't want to have a home. I don't want to have money. I just want to play. I want to have fun. This is the shared fantasy of Peter Pan. And he, and he develops a shared fantasy with Wendy. Wendy is a girl. Um, he invades a home through an open window. Very, <laughs> a very apt metaphor. And uh, they're beginning to have a relationship, actually. She tries to be a mature woman. She wants a home, probably children. She loves him. But he insists to remain a child. He refuses to grow up. And so she accommodates him. She becomes his mother, apropos yesterday's uh, movie. I've been asked several questions pertaining to yesterday's movie, and I'll attempt to answer some of them now. The narcissist can return to a woman he had devalued and discarded. Actually, it happens very often. At the time, I coined the, the word hoovering. So he hoovers them. He reacquires them. But the narcissist cannot return to a woman who betrayed the shared fantasy. The narcissist and the psychopath co-author the shared fantasy. There's a co-authorship. Co the shared fantasy is, is co-written. And he has the exclusive right, and only he has the right, to discard the other party. But the other party doesn't have a right to discard him. And if she betrays the shared fantasy, he will never go back to her. Uh, betraying the shared fantasy means exiting the shared fantasy, and usually this is done by via triangulation and cheating, introducing a third, ma uh, another man, into the picture, and bonding with that other man for one night or for one year, a love affair or casual sex. It doesn't matter. Bonding physically, bonding emotionally. Uh, it's exiting the shared fantasy. It's like waking up, and so this the psychopathic narcissist cannot forgive and will never return to a partner who had betrayed the shared fantasy. It's also very important how the partner exits the shared fantasy. If the exit is aggressive and malicious, vindictive and malevolent, and angry and, and, and violent, then this would add another incentive to never revisit the shared fantasy. And, and, and the psychopathic narcissist cannot relate to a woman except via these phases. Whenever the psychopathic narcissist approaches a woman, it's via a shared fantasy. Even if this woman used to be in his life, his ex-wife, the second time around, when he hoovers her, when he tries to re-enter her life, it would be again via the shared fantasy. There's no other way. But if she exited the shared fantasy before, there is no possibility to re-establish a shared fantasy. She blocked the way to a shared fantasy because he cannot relate to her. As an adult, he cannot relate to her. End of story. So a woman can be discarded, can be devalued, and the narcissist and psychopath will come back, will return to that very woman and will try to re-establish shared fantasy. 
But if she exited the shared fantasy by betraying the shared fantasy, by annulling the shared fantasy, by contradicting the shared fantasy, by waking the psychopathic narcissist up in the middle of the dream, this dream, then he can never go back to her. Uh, some women keep disrupting the formation and maturation of the shared fantasy. And when this happens, the psychopathic narcissist is doubly energized. He, he tries to coerce this kind of woman to accept the shared fantasy. And if he fails in this, then she becomes a source of fl a fling, or a, a partner for casual sex. So it's the only case where casual sex is acceptable to the psychopathic narcissist. These are women who stop and start, stop and start, approach and avoid. It's approach avoidance repetition compulsion. They start the shared fantasy, and then they recoil, they, they disrupt the fantasy. And so the fantasy is never fully formed, but there's, there's sufficient... There are sufficient elements of the shared fantasy with such a woman to enable sex. And, but actually, it's casual sex, because there's no shared fantasy, and usually no exclusivity as well. Another case is when there is a transition from shared fantasy to anti-fantasy, without going through the interstitial phase. And this leads to trauma. It's among the very, very few cases where psychopathic narcissists are traumatized seriously traumatized. They have what would, in other people, pass or, or be considered emotional reaction. It's when they are in the middle of a shared fantasy, and then the woman exits abruptly, without allowing them to prepare themselves mentally for the exit. So they're in the middle of this love story, they're in the middle of this video game, they're in the middle of this um, virtual reality, augmented reality, whatever you want to call it, and then suddenly, suddenly the woman cheats, maybe vindictively, maybe ostentatiously. Maybe she rubs the narcissist's face in it. It's an in-your-face kind of thing. Maybe, maybe she breaks up the shared fantasy in some other way. Uh, he discovers that she had lied to him about, about everything. Whatever the case may be, if there is a, a rapid, a, an abrupt transition, from the middle, from within the shared fantasy, into a breakup, without going through the middle phase, the interstitial phase, the psychopathic narcissist is heavily traumatized. We will discuss this in our next video. So the shared fantasy continues, and and so on and so forth. But the intimate part, the the psychopathic narcissist is happy as a lark, is happy go lucky. Because everything he wants, he gets. He wants sex, he gets sex, fun, adventure, sometimes money. I mean, his, his shared fantasy is, uh, is alive and well, thank you. But it is the intimate partner who gets increasingly more frustrated. Because her expectations are more institutional and more conformist. Even the, the wildest, most promiscuous, utterly dysregulated and discombobulated woman out there expects as a minimum and at the very least a, some kind of structured structured quasi committed relationship um, we are not talking casual sex women of course engage in casual sex as do men it's not casual sex it's a relationship the transmission the message from the psychopathic narcissist in the shared fantasy is that this is a relationship he doesn't come out honestly and say, listen, all I'm looking for is sex. Are you, are you in? Because he's likely to be rebuffed owing to his personality and, and so on. So instead he's lying. He's deceiving the intimate partner. He's telling her that, yeah, it's a relationship. It's serious. It's getting more and more serious by the day. And who knows where it might lead. To many mouths. So the partner becomes more and more frustrated. And the first thing she does usually is deny him the sadistic and kinky elements in the sex. She becomes much more conventional. Exclusivity is still maintained. She, if she survived the first phase without triangulating and cheating, then at this stage she's, she's not cheating. But what happens is she is much less accommodating of the special sexual needs of the psychopathic narcissist. 
and she's much less adventurous she's much less open to his wishes she's normally she's not getting what she wants she's not giving him what he wants he's looking for fun adventure these days no way he's looking for faint sadism kinkiness and so on well sorry pal i didn't get what you had promised i'm going to give you what i had promised so sexuality becomes highly regimented and conventional and boring frankly it's because the the intimate partners of, of psychopathic narcissists mistake the shared fantasy phase they think it's a it's a passing they think it's temporary love bombing they think it's infatuation and and they think that once once both parties go through this phase then it's time for realistic plans it's like okay we have to go through this you know infatuation love bombing this that last last you know and but at some point we have to settle down we are adults and we have to say okay you know how do we go where do we go from here what are we going to do what's the next stage what's the next step but for the psychopathic narcissist there is no next step shared fantasy is it end of story there's nothing beyond it and so when the intimate partner discovers this she's utterly shocked because narcissists and psychopaths hunt prey on women in settings that are reserved usually for long-term relationships um, if you want if you want to have casual sex you go to a bar i don't know you go to a club including a sex club you, you, you go on certain dating apps and you're honest about what you're looking for you go that you go to parties you know all night parties all nighters um, with mdma and god knows what else i mean there are ways i mean there are places venues ways uh, where people go to have casual sex both men and women go there knowing full well that they're going there to pick up a one-night partner but the narcissists and psychopaths narcissists and psychopaths pick up intimate partners in ways and in venues and in places that are reserved for serious long-term relationships so on the one hand they give the distinct impression that they're looking for something serious and long-term and on the other hand their behavior reveals that they're actually looking only for a playmate here i'm connecting this video to the previous one they're looking for a playmate in a shared fantasy and they withhold they don't fully belong it's clear that they, their heart is not in it they are, they're like it's like an, it's like the entertainment part of the evening. it's like recreation the relationship the so-called relationship is recreational it's like well shall we see a movie no let me have a relationship let me have a shared fantasy so of course the the intimate partner feels disappointed she feels angry she feels pardon vulgarity totally fucked she feels deceived and it leads these women to cheat or to triangulate as a way to terminate the relationship the re relationship with narcissistic psychopaths are very addictive because the carrot is there dangling it's very titillating it's like a teasing relationship it's like um, you don't really as an intimate partner of a psychopathic narcissist there's no really good time to finish a re finish off the relationship to break up because you always say to yourself maybe if i wait another day maybe if i wait another week maybe if i wait another month it's going to get better maybe then i'm going to get what i want so like there's no good time to break up and this is becoming very addictive this intermittent reinforcement creates addiction so these relationships are very addictive so women in these relationships find it very difficult to let go very difficult to break up and say goodbye and what they usually do they pick up the first men these men first men they they see and they cheat or they triangulate egregiously and the aim is actually to get rid of the psychopathic losses to terminate the relationship the men they cheat with are utterly irrelevant they're nobodies they are like dispensable or disposable utensils usually we're talking about one night stands and so but the, 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 the main aim the main message is 
I can't survive in this relationship anymore. I can't survive in this in your shared fantasy. I can't be a figment of your dream anymore. I want to. I want to have a real three-dimensional existence. And by teaming up with the first man I see, however inappropriate, whatever scum, low-life, junkie, loser, whoever he is, at least he is going to give me the, the feeling, the sensation that I exist, if nothing else. Exists, maybe even desire. So they restore themselves. These women restore themselves emotionally, elevate their self-esteem, and... and Get rid of the of the psychopathic narcissists, usually via triangulation or, or cheating. And of course, there's always the bonus of hurting the psychopathic narcissist in the process. You see, narcissists reify, embody, object in con inconstancy. They delete um, online material. They delete I don't know, messages, photos, videos. They are married, so they are unavailable, or they are unavailable in other ways. They are in constant touch with multiple women. They triangulate. They, I mean, they they constantly broadcast messages. I'm here. It's a touch and go. I'm here, and I'm not really here. N now you see me. Now you don't. It's like a, a slate of hand. It's like a magic show, and. Many of these women already have very serious problems with object constancy. For example, borderlines. Borderlines have no object constancy. They're terrified of abandonment and rejection. Same with codependence. And they have very dysfunctional ways of coping with object inconstancy. And what the psychopathic narcissist does, he kind of amplifies these fears, these fissures, these breaks in the personality of these women. And they can't tolerate it. Many of them say that they feel dead. When, when the psychopathic narcissist is away and they don't know what he's doing or if he's ever coming back, they feel annihilated. They feel dead. As though they had, as though, as though he had dismembered them or as though they had dissolved, diluted in some invisible fluid. And of course, these women have tremendous abandonment anxiety and uh, fear of loss. And so sometimes it becomes so unbearable, so intolerable, this constant giving and taking, giving and taking, that these women um, um, counter-triangulate. The psychopathic narcissist triangulates, they counter-triangulate. They, they think he's cheating. These, many of these women are very jealous because of this object inconstancy. So they cheat preemptively, preemptive abandonment. They abandon him before he abandons them. But throughout the shared fantasy, long before this phase, of, long before the interstitial phase, long before this phase of frustration, disappointment, and rage, long before this, women begin, be, uh, the, 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 int the potential intimate partners, the, the women who participate in the shared fantasy, these women reject their permanent role as sex slaves, uh, fuck buddies, playmates, toys, co-fantasies. These women want more, and they want exclusivity. Uh, and as long as... So, so I would call the interstitial phase to borrow from someone who, who is, whose writings are almost as good as mine. I would call this interstitial phase uh, a winter of discontent. And, but as long as this discontent is not translated to specific demands, ultimatums, withholding, conflict, betrayal, cheating, triangulation, as, as long as the discontent is ambient, it's just in the air, the psychopathic narcissist continues to pretend, continues to act as though they are all on the same shared fantasy page. As long as the woman doesn't come openly, demands, make, uh, threatens, gives an ultimatum, Withholds, creates conflict, betrays, cheats, um, triangulates. The psychopathic narcissist would continue to pretend like nothing's happening, like there's no problem whatsoever. And this, but but he already feels he already he the discontent is in the air. It's in small gestures. It's in body language. It's in in pricking remarks. It's in derogatory comments. It's in so he he's he's he has a radar. You know he has cold empathy. And he picks up 
he picks up this music, this atonal, atonal music, this these off-key um, sequences, and he begins to prepare mentally for the third phase, which is the anti-fantasy phase. And what he does in the interstitial phase to prepare for the anti for the anti-fantasy phase, the next phase, is the first thing he does, he decathexes. Cathexis is an investment of emotional energy, so to speak, investment of emotions in an object, usually a human object. So this is cathexis. So analysis takes back, takes back his emotions, his hopes, his wishes, his dreams, his fantasies, he takes them back from the intimate partner. He no longer, he begins to no longer see her as a potential. He begins to realize that it's about to enter the end game and she's about to cheat, triangulate, or simply dump him or break up. So he decathexes, takes away his emotions. He begins to grieve. There's a process of grieving, Kubler Ross, the five stages of grieving comes. He denies, then he becomes angry, then he becomes depressed, and then, then you know, grieving goes on. And he immediately begins to seek alternatives. And this is what women feel. When women describe the bad, the bad parts of their relationships, they describe this. They de they're describing the interstitial phase. They're descri describing the part of the relationship, period in the relationship, where the narcissist withdraws, withholds, grieves, and actively seeks, seeks alternatives. And so, at this stage, usually, uh, women also are also making a transition. So on the one hand, the psychopathic narcissist begins to detach, and women become much more demanding. And if they are codependent or borderline, they become much more clinging. So they begin to demand more sex, more emotions, more time, more attention, more intimacy, more commitment, more sharing, more investment, etc., etc. Women become very demanding, and these demands. These overtly expressed, verbalized demands inexorably and ineluctably lead to the anti-fantasy phase, which is the third phase of every relationship psychopathic narcissist has with a woman. And that's the phase of decoupling. Decoupling. Breaking up the couple. Indeed, there is no real couple, of course, because the intimate partner never receives any of the elements of the shared fantasy that were her elements. And so there's no, no real couple here. There's only take and take, no give and take. The nurse, psychopathic narcissist takes all the time. Takes all the time and dangles the promise of giving. So the intimate partner has a promise of giving while the psychopathic narcissist has a reality of taking. So there's no real couple, at least not reciprocity or reciprocal couple. But in the narcissist's mind, he had given. He had given what? Himself. His presence he is the greatest gift to humanity. And so here he is, um, stooping to the level of his intimate partner. She should be eternally minimum grateful that he is in her life. It's the adventure of a lifetime. It's the most amazing thing that has ever happened to her and will ever happen to her. So this in itself is, is sufficient, is it not? He doesn't need to give anything beyond his near cosmically significant presence. So in his mind, there is a couple, an active couple, where he gave, gives his presence and blessings and gifts, and she gives whatever she gives. So there's a couple. And the other fantasy phase is a decoupling in the psychopathic narcissist's mind. At this stage, he cuts off all sex, and it's a stage of celibacy, abstinence. The psychopathic narcissist becomes uh, asexual and the relationship becomes sexless or uh, the partners agree on an open relationship, open marriage and then they each pursue sex elsewhere. But as I said, this is extremely rare. The minute the partner tries to transition from simulation to reality, the minute she refuses to participate in the shared fantasy, the minute she tries to convert the shared fantasy into reality, one way or another, the minute, for example, if she attempts to extract uni, what the narcissist perceives to be unilateral benefits, 
material benefits, other benefits, which she demands sex, she demands his time, she demands his attention, uh, she wants to share with him, which he finds um, oppressively boring, or she obstructs his work, his all important work, or she makes any demands or ultimatums of any kind, or she, of course, if she verbally abuses him, if she narcissistically injures him, and ultimately if she cheats on him or betrays him in any in any way. Uh, all these lead to the to decoupling, to the anti-fantasy phase. Uh, but with some psychopathic narcissist extreme on the extreme end of the spectrum, it's enough if the partner questions them. Like, remember, Minnie Mouse, she disagreed with me. I almost fired her. So it's enough if the partner questions them. If she disagrees with them, criticizes, mocks, shows disappointment. It's enough if she withholds any of the three S's, sex, supply, services. Or if it's enough, any combination of the above is enough to convince the psychopathic narcissist that the shared fantasy is over. The shared fantasy dissipates and the cool-headed, unflinching, callous, ruthless, heartless, dispassionate, disempathic, psychopathic narcissist takes over and this is coupled with impulsivity, vindictiveness, defiance and other wonderful traits of the, of the psychopath. Psychopathic narcissist at that point instantly and totally gives up on the partner emotionally. He decathects. He discards the fantasy like it had never existed. The role play, the game are over. It's exactly like you know, slipping the computer. The narcissist psychopath then wakes up and he fully reverts to reality. And the first thing he does, he absents himself. He withdraws himself, he takes himself out of the equation. He's, he suddenly is not present. It's difficult to reach him, he ghosts, you can't talk to him, he's impatient and so on and so forth. Sometimes physically, but always mentally. And if, if he's in a marriage, for example, he becomes a roommate, a very disinterested, cold, dispassionate, and mildly, you know, offensive roommate. Nothing much more. And if the intimate partner insists on preserving the shared fantasy, after she had, after she had demanded, demanded things, after she had presented ultimatums, after she, after the interstitial phase, if she insists continue to perpetuate and propagate the shared fantasy. The narcissist and psychopath becomes egregiously, verbally abusive, withering, annihilating. And if this doesn't work, then the narcissist and psychopath pushes the partner to cheat on him with others in order to terminate the relationship without repercussions or to guilt trip the intimate partner into submission. And this instantaneous transition from shared fantasy to transactional reality is, is I mean, this is what, what ruins the narcissist's intimate partner. How he switches off, how she ceases to exist, not overnight, but over a minute. How replaceable, interchangeable, and dispensable she had proven to be in his life. And at that point, the narcissist loses all visible and invisible interest, hidden interest in the, in the partner. The partner can triangulate, she can go with men, she can come back. She, he doesn't care at all. He doesn't even monitor or, or record what's happened, the, the happenings. He, he doesn't regard, for example, other men as competitors. He redirects all his energies and attention and focus on other tasks, not the least of which is creating another shared fantasy with another target. The partner is erased emotionally. The, the psychopathic narcissist, exactly like the borderline, has no object constancy, but as opposed to the borderline, the psychopathic narcissist can turn object constancy on and off. He can decide this object is present in my life. I will think about her constantly. I will love bomb her. 
I will promise her I will she will become an, an integral and important part of my recreational good life. And then he can switch it off. And she 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 doesn't give her even a passing thought. The woman who is who had been the most important thing in the psychopathic narcissist's life on Wednesday means utterly nothing to him on Thursday. Not only means nothing to him, it has no existence. I'm saying not a passing thought. At that stage, the narcissist and psychopath reads all cues perfectly in order to affirm whether the partner is still uh, respectful, disrespectful, unfaithful, disloyal, a liar, and so on. The partner becomes, is gradually transformed into a persecutory object, a potential, potential enemy, hostile. And this helps the narcissist to move on to the next fantasy roleplay with the next idealized partner, if and when he chooses to. It also alerts the narcissist to any dangers or risks inherent in the situation. So narcissists are not idiots, and they know that some women are going to react very badly to this kind of treatment, and are going to lash back, and are going to do to blackmail or to threaten or to you know there are risks inherent in treating people this way. And so the narcissist becomes hypervigilant once again, and to disconnect, to remove his emotional investment. In the original object of the shared fantasy, the narcissist uses splitting. To switch from shared fantasy to anti-fantasy, he splits his erstwhile intimate partner. Now, she is no longer a delightful, cute, amazing, intelligent, breathtaking, captivating, irresistible, sexy thing. Now she is a witch cruel, sadistic, withholding, abusive, frustrating, deceitful, so on, and cheating, so on. He splits, he moves from white to black, from right to wrong, from all good to all bad. This dichotomous thinking is a primitive defense mechanism, typical before the age of two years old. It's a baby mechanism. And borderlines have it, psychopathic narcissists have it. And they use it to allow them to peacefully, to preserve internal equilibrium, to peacefully transition from one view of the intimate partner to another, thereby letting them discard the previous shared fantasy in favor of the next one. But that's not enough, because the psychopathic narcissist needs his partner to confirm with her behavior the new view of her. So if he regards her as a bad mother now, because it's all about mother, of course, motherhood. Is, she's a maternal figure. We established that yesterday. At this stage, in the anti-fantasy, interstitial and anti-fantasy phases, the last two phases, she had become a mother. And he's switching from a good mother to a bad mother. But he needs the partner to act the bad mother. And he does it via a psychological defense mechanism known as projective identification. Projective identification is when we force other people to behave in ways that confirm our view of the world, our theory of mind, and our comfort zone. So if, if the psychopathic narcissist expects or has a new view of his earth, previous intimate partner as bad mother, he would behave in ways that force her to behave as a bad mother. He would, he would uh, create... Projective identification and projective introjection. So it, it would resonate with her. He would, for example, reject her. He would abuse her. He would withhold. He would be, become passive aggressive. He would become frustrating. And he knows that by misbehaving this way, he will render her, he will make her aggressive, violent, uh, disempathic. And then he will say, you see, I told you she's a witch. So he provokes her to act the part. His misconduct provokes the partner to flee, of course, and to seek succor, or to retaliate with another safe man. This man could be inferior to the psychopathic narcissist. Actually, in most cases, it's, it's someone who is inferior to the psychopathic narcissist, because the intimate partner cannot risk a second rejection. A safe man, someone who is inferior to her and to the psychopathic narcissist, would never reject her, would never abuse her, would never compound her injury. So there's always a kind of deterioration in quality control 
the intimate partner selects the psychopathic narcissist because he's dominant, he's charismatic, he's interesting, he's fascinating, he's adventurous, he's fun, he's uh, sex, sexual, he's, you know. But then her next choice, intended to triangulate and break the, uh, break the spell, exit the shared fantasy, her next choice is bound to be the exact opposite of the narcissist. He's bound to be a loser, better, mild, modest, unassuming, meek even, and possibly physical inferior. The cheating does get to the narcissist and the psychopath, um, but only if it is done within the shirt fantasy. In other words, cheating during the interstitial phase and the anti-fantasy is utterly meaningless. That's what women don't understand. Triangulation cheating, trying to, to get the psychopathic narcissist to be jealous or to get a rise out of him or to to get him to react somehow, or to get him to reacquire the partner or to get him to try to, re, to restore the relation. I mean, it's all hopeless in the interstitial and the um, anti-fantasy phase. Because then the narcissist decathected. He took away his emotions. He doesn't care anymore what the partner is doing. And in the shared fantasy, any triangulation or cheating or will mean the end of the of the I mean will traumatize the psychopathic narcissist, but also will end will end any connection with the woman. So the woman can't win. It's a no-win game with the psychopathic narcissist. There's no way in the shared fantasy to cheat or to triangulate or to otherwise call for help, cry for help. Because if the woman does this, there's an immediate transition to the interstitial and anti-fantasy phase. End of shared fantasy, bye-bye, Narciss doesn't want to see her ever again. If she waits until the interstitial phase or the anti-fantasy phase, he doesn't care. He doesn't care what she does. There's no strategy to coerce the narcissist or the psychopath to transition from shared fantasy to reality. And even when they do, for example, I don't know, they set up a family, they have children, they get married, it's still a shared fantasy. And this is what the partners, this is why partners of, of intimate partners, spouses, mates of psychopathic narcissists, they keep saying that the whole thing was not real, was a lie. And in many respects it is, it's a confabulation, it's a script, it's a narrative, it's a piece of fiction. The narcissist is an observer of his life, so he's kind of acting the part. It's a theater production. He never really is into, emotionally. He has no access to emotions. He's not really into his partner or even into his children. He's kind of a spectator, mildly interested spectator, mind you, but you know, he has seen better shows than his own life. Only when it comes to his grandiosity, he's animated. He's animated, he's invested, he's you know, protective, he's hypervigilant. He's when you want to see a psychopathic narcissist in his full panoply of the limited emotions he has, challenge his grandiosity or buttress his grandiosity, do something with his grandiosity. The family, the family the, has nothing to do with grandiosity. This is a language he does not understand. Unless, of course, the children somehow, or his wife somehow, support his grandiosity. So you have the Jackson 5, you have Michael Jackson. He supported his father's grandiosity. So he became meaningful, and there was an emotional investment in Michael Jackson. Look where it got him. But otherwise, no way. The, the problem with, with the cheating, triangulation, or any other form of, of brinkmanship, any other form of cry for help that brings the relationship or the shared fantasy to the brink of uh, uh, make or break the brink of do or, or die. Um, the problem with this kind of brinkmanship tactics, cheating, triangulation, and so on, uh, is that first of all, the intimate partner who engages in these kind of behaviors, she becomes a bad object and splitting. And also it makes it impossible for the psychopathic narcissist to entertain counterfactual, what if, egodystonic fantasies. In other words, if you want the psychopathic narcissist to sit with himself one evening and say, I think I failed, I, I failed here, I misbehaved here, or 
what if I behave, what if I had behaved differently? If you want him to contemplate alternative scenarios, counterfactual scenarios, if you want him to improve his ways or to become more efficient in managing the shared fantasy, if you want him to recaffect you, you as an intimate partner, if you want him to reinvest in you, you want him to re rejuvenate or revive what what used to be between you, what, what a second animal. The worst possible way is brinkmanship because it doesn't allow him to entertain these counterfactual what if scenarios and he cannot wreak affect you by betraying or cheating or triangulating or or I don't know acting aggressively or you you exited the shared fantasy you can never re-enter there's no such thing betraying the shared fantasy is the worst thing ever possible within the shared fantasy the intimate partner has much more power than outside the shared fantasy exiting the shared fantasy is the ultimate betrayal um, it's possible for the narcissist to have in the future emotionless sex or ad hoc collaboration with such a woman but never another shared fantasy within the shared fantasy there are cycles of idealization devaluation discard Losses finds replacements, but there's always a potential of a second shared fantasy in the future, in one year, in half a year, in two months, in two years, in 20 years. The potential for shared fantasy, another one, second one, third one, fourth one, exists if you hadn't exited the shared fantasy um, overtly, obtrusively, openly, ostentatiously, conspicuously. If you exited the shared fantasy in any way shape or form even for example by making demands challenging the fantasy element in the shared in the shared space i mean you're you're finished you're lost Marxists will never take a chance with you again because his entire equilibrium and homeostasis inside subsists of fantasy how does the diagnostic and statistical manual define narcissistic personality disorder grandiose fantasy the narcissist's life is a fantasy life when you're challenging his fantasy you're challenging his life you become a life threat and who wants to be with a life threat not you evidently but also not the psychopathic narcissist have a heart will you says Minnie. have a heart Putting my glasses back to define meaning.